Philippians chapter number 3. These are very familiar words of the Apostle Paul, but uh, we'll begin reading in verse number 10. Verse number 10, he says, That I may know him. Now, the Apostle Paul is a saved man. He has been separated unto the gospel for the Gentile people. Been called, he's an apostle. Through his own testimony, has been caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, he could not tell. The experience he had, Brother Phil, he couldn't even talk about it for 14 years. The Apostle Paul is widely recognized amongst Bible believers as outside the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the greatest men who have ever walked the face of the earth. Of course, Jesus said John the Baptist was the greatest born of women. But you've got to put Paul right in there in the conversation. The Apostle Paul was not somebody who would come to church on Sunday morning and not come back Sunday night. The Apostle Paul was not somebody who would shy away from telling somebody about the Lord. The Apostle Paul was one who was given to studying the Scriptures, but he wasn't so heady and high-minded that he wouldn't mend a tent along the road on, on, on the side. And the great Apostle Paul said this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might, might attain unto the resurrection of the dead not as though I had already attained either were already perfect but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus brethren I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for, Lord, the good singing. We thank you for the good testimonies. We thank you for this dear couple running up and down the highways trying to raise awareness for the need for folks that didn't have needs for Bibles. God, thank you I've got a Bible tonight. Lord, I can't imagine my life without a Bible. It'd be like having eyes with no sight. It'd be like having a portrait with no color. The Bible brings not only joy, and hope, and peace, but it brings substance to our lives. God, we thank you for the word of God. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you'd help us. Lord, if you don't help us, all of our efforts will be in vain. Father, for without you we can do nothing. But, Lord, little is much when you are in it. So I pray you'd enlighten our minds, you'd challenge our hearts, you'd speak to us, you'd help us, you'd comfort us. You would certainly charge us. Lord, you would do something for your people tonight that would be so real and so... Uh, transparent and so powerful that they'd forget uh, what's on their agenda tonight after service. They'd forget about social media. They'd forget about uh, their schedule the rest of the week. They would be so enthralled with Jesus that nothing else matters. If the great apostle Paul wanted to know more about you, how much more? Those of our caliber. Now, Father, I pray you'd use this unworthy best so I don't know what's going on with my throat, Father, but I know you've got all that under control. But help us tonight. Certainly be with Brother Gary and Miss Veronica and their families. Comfort them. Be with the sick and afflicted. Touch them. Lord, those that are watching live stream, bless them. But those that are here in the sanctuary tonight, undergird them with your presence so real they'll leave out changed. And certainly, God, if there's someone under the sound of our voice that does not know you in the free pardon of sins, I pray you'd save them tonight. Help them to call on Jesus. And we'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Here we find the great apostle. 
And in the third chapter of Philippians, he's at a crossroads in his life. He's in prison, and while he's in prison, he is beginning to reflect on some things. Uh, first of all, let me say, he begins to evaluate his past. Look at verse number 4 of the same chapter. He says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he, ha he hath, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the uh, righteousness which is in the law, blameless. The Apostle Paul's pedigree was impeccable. As far as a Jew was concerned, it got no better. He studied under the right professors, he had uh, 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 the right pedigree, he had all the things that any other well-rounded Jewish man would love to have. And when it came to the law, he was blameless. He said, if anybody's got a reason to boast in the flesh, he said, I'm more. But look at verse number 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, uh, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, uh, and do count them but done that I may win Christ uh, uh, my dear friends, he said, uh, yes, I have reason to boast in the flesh, uh, but everything that would have made me uh, somebody that was a notable, I have counted it as loss. It has become done to me. It is not important to me that I may win Christ. I wonder tonight, as I'm thinking when Brother Sammy preached the other night about how there are some things that when you're in a dark place you need to disassociate with. When he spoke of relationships and careers and friendships, and I, I wonder what we've counted as dung for the excellency of Christ. See, we live in a day and age where we, as independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, spit-right, walk-right, talk-right Baptists, uh, uh, we want to pound our chest and say we've got the, all the truth and we've got the right doctrine and we've got the right things. Uh, but we've bought into the humanistic philosophy that whosoever's got gains the most toys wins. How much have you sought God personally this week asking Him that you may know Him? They preach, I've been saved. I've been saved 47 years. But i got news for you. The more I learn about him, Brother Josh, the more I realize I don't know anything. The more I think I've got him figured out, he just blows my little pea brain. See, our problem is we want to put God in a box because we like being in a box. I do remind you, he's the God of the universe and the earth is his footstool. We limit God, therefore we don't see God move. He's evaluating his past, and he said, everything that I was doesn't mean anything. He said, the only thing I know is I need to know more of him. Hmm. Not only is he evaluating his past, he's examining his progress. Look at verse 12. Powerful words from one of the greatest men to ever walk in shoe leather. He says, not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect. He's not talking about sinless. He's talking about mature. He's talking about completed in Christ. He's talking about being whole in the Lord. This is the same man that wrote to the church at Corinth that he had to die daily. Hmm? Why? Because our flesh is rotten. And our flesh wells up. And our flesh wants to take pride and credit in things that we really don't do. Not I, but Christ that dwelleth or liveth in me. Paul said, uh, Not that I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that which 
uh, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Paul is examining his progress. He says, I've not attained it. I'm not perfect yet. I've got a ways to go yet. Uh, I haven't apprehended it yet. The Apostle Paul, when he's talking about apprehending what he is really trying to grasp uh, his mind around, Brother Clint, uh, is how in the world would God even save me? Why would he spend time with me? He said, I persecuted the church. I had Christians killed and slaughtered. Uh, I held the garments of Stephen, uh, of the men that stoned Stephen. Uh, he said, why would Christ love me and save me? He said, I haven't apprehended. He said, I've been apprehended by Christ. He came seeking me. Mm -mm. I don't know about you, but I'm glad for the day he came to where I was. I was on my way to hell, deserved to be there. I deserve to be in hell for things I've said and done since I've got saved. Uh, but I'm not going because I've been apprehended by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he saved me, washed me, cleansed me, robed me, justified me. Hallelujah, one of these days take me to glory. So Paul is evaluating his past, he's examining his progress, but I want to focus for a little bit on the expectations for the present. Look at verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to get a hold of this. You're going to miss it. Paul's in prison. Brother Ray, Paul has no expectation that he's getting out of prison. His life could be taken any day. And yet, he said, I'm going to press on toward the mark of the high calling of Christ. He has some expectations for the future even though he has a death sentence on his name. Now get a hold of this. He's in prison. His future is now out of his control. He doesn't pull back. He doesn't stand pat. He sets his sight on more. Little adversity come in your life, first thing you want to do is pull back. Little bad news, uh, and all of a sudden you want to stand pat. Well, I can't do any more. Not the apostle. Look what he says. Look in verse 13. Look at it. I want you to see it. He says, Forgetting those things which are behind, and here it is, and reaching forth unto the things which are before. He said, I press toward the mark. He said, uh, I'm not pulling back. I'm not standing pat. I'm reaching forth. Listen, either you're expanding, you're walking by faith, or you're going backwards, friend. Too many people trying to hold on to what they have uh, and they're pulling back uh, and in so doing they're dishonoring the Savior that saved them. Mm. I got a phone call to my <laughs> Christian we was over helping, them out to, uh, helping him at his house and well Annette was helping him. My phone rang off. The, she, she, he, I heard him say to her does his phone never ring? I had preacher after preacher after preacher call me. I had a preacher call me today from Alabama. He said, well, we're finally starting to get back in the swing of things. Boy, that's foreign to me. We've been back in the swing of things for over a year. I mean, we only took two weeks off. Uh, 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 but people pulled back. Uh, and look at how many lives have been affected. Uh, how many souls died and went to hell. Uh, how many uh, missionaries didn't get support. Uh, how many evangelists lost meetings. Uh, uh, because folks did not reach forth. I got news for you. Coronavirus is not the worst thing that's hit this world since Jesus Christ ascended. But we act like we can't do anything. We got to stand pat. Do you know how many churches I have and preachers I have talked to where they've lost people, they've lost people, people aren't coming back to church, uh, 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 they don't know if they're ever going to recover the losses. Uh, hey, I don't know about much. Uh, 
All I know is we just tried to reach forth. Uh, uh, God bless last year. Ended up having five revival meetings. Uh, over 20 saved uh, uh, in a building program. Uh, I mean, God's have been good. God's have been a blessing. Offerings all time high. Uh, hey, it's not time to pull back. Uh, it's not time to go by the wayside and stand pat. Uh, it's time to reach forth. Uh, and just see how good God's going to be. I want to preach on that little thought for a minute. Reaching forth. Reaching forth. Huh? Does not the Bible say draw nigh to God and He'll draw nigh to you? Isn't that kind of encompassing the thought reaching to God and then He reaches down to you? I don't know, little baby, anywhere. Don't walk up to somebody and throw their hands up that somebody won't reach down and pick them up. Huh? And all the Lord says is trust Him. All the Lord says is seek Him. All the Lord says is a, a, a thirst for Him. And the more we reach forth for the things of God, the more we'll have. You know why some of you are miserable? Been standing pat. You have. You've been standing pat. You pulled back. You're afraid. I know life can be scary. Just drive around that roundabout out there. That'd scare you half to death. What in the world is going on with that mess? Wait till it goes to two lanes. It's going to be a mess. Deputy Foster there is going to be running accident reports like crazy. Uh, it's nuts. I know there are fearful things in life. The fear of not knowing. I understand that. But you know what supersedes that? Trusting God. I can't control anybody else anyway. So why worry about it? Well, let me give you a few things on reaching forth. We should be reaching farther than ever before in several areas. The first is we ought to reach farther to fellowship with Christ. There is a great void of people knowing the Savior. Hmm. I was listening, somebody read me something the other day about, about uh, somebody talking about people, and I'm wondering, I'm glad folks are being saved. Are you discipling them? Part of the Great Commission was not only to win them and baptize them, but to teach them that they may be able to go and teach others also. But there's a great void in our churches of teaching people how to live for Christ. We have gotten into the charismatic view of let's entertain them to keep them coming. You know what to keep them coming? Jesus. We need to reach farther to fellowship with Christ. Again, verse 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings uh, being made conformable unto His death. Paul had a desire to know everything he could about Christ. Hmm. He used to kick against the pricks of Christ and now he can't get enough of learning about Christ. Every Bible believer should have a desire to know Jesus in a more personal, intimate way than you ever have before. Mm -hmm. I mentioned Net and I has been married 32 years. Bless the Lord. She's got a special crown in heaven, I promise you. Uh, it's funny. I, she wanted me to print something for her, so I went walking back through the church early, and I heard her walking. I know her walk. I knew it was her. I knew I, it wasn't Noreen. It wasn't Billy. I knew it was Ned. I know her walk. Uh, I know her look. See, you all looking at me, sometimes I'll say one of them off-color things, I look up and I'm getting the look. You don't see the look. I see the look. I know the look. The look means it's going to be a quiet ride on the way home. You'd think after hearing me preach for 34 years, she'd get used to the fact that I'm just going to say it. You know, it's going to come out. It's, it's coming, you know. But I still get the look. You get the look too, don't you? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I know your wife. You get the look. That doesn't cut from the same cloth, brother. Mm, uh huh. I know her walk. I know her look. I know her touch. I know. Why? Because we have invested our lives together. We was watching a show last night or something, and the lady was pregnant, and 
you know, out to here, and he's he's giving her a spa day and doing her nails for. Her. I said, the man you was married to when we had kids didn't do that, but the man you're married to now would. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was a sorry husband back then, but I've figured it out now. It just took me a while, huh? But hey, we know one another. But I've been saved 47 years. How much do I know him? Do I know his voice? Do I know his touch? Do I know his walk? Do I know his scent? Hey, that uh, 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 maid there in uh, uh, the Song of Solomon, she, she could smell the myrrh when he'd been there. Uh, 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 do I know all that I can about Christ? Do I know him intimately? Let me ask you, do you know him? Hmm. I'm afraid, Miss Judy, there are a lot of people who know my voice, but they don't know his voice. Oh, that's Brother Doug preaching. They don't know when he's doing the preaching. Sad. Now listen, he speaks a lot of times in a still small voice, and if you're not careful, you've got a lot of noise going on in your life. And he'll be speaking, you won't get it. I've learned if you can just get, get so close to where he starts speaking and you turn off the radio and you shut things down and you just you just start listening and you start meditating on the Word of God and you spend time with Him in the Scriptures, you'll find a side of Him you didn't know existed. You ought to reach forth. That ought to be your goal. Lord, I want to know You like I've never known You. I want to know You in a, with a personal intimacy. We should desire to know the power of His resurrection. The pastor, Brother Rocky's pastor, said something in prayer the other day. Boy, it spoke volumes to me about them young preachers preaching. Some of them young preachers did a great job. It gave us a lot of hope, us old guys. Those two that about passed out, I remember being able to preach like that. Uh, 30 years ago, jumping pews and all that stuff. Now I can't hardly walk and breathe. But anyway, it's called getting fat. That happens to us. But he said this. Brother Goodman said this when he's praying. He said, Lord, thank you that they knew the doctrine and they had a dynamic about them. What he was saying, they had a touch of God on their life. There's a lot of people who know the doctrine, but they don't have the power of God on their life. My Aunt Lynn's sitting back there, she'll tell you, her daddy, the preacher, the man of God, he walked into the hospital. He didn't carry a family Bible up underneath his arm. Didn't have a necktie on. I mean, might have had a sport coat on, might not have. He'd walk in the whole hospital, spread like the, apart like the Red Sea, and they'd say, the preacher's here, the preacher's here. I'm talking about drive four hours to a hospital never been to, but they knew he was the man of God. Why? Because he had the power of God on his life. Uh, hey, uh, we live in a day and age where men claim to be preachers, uh, and uh, they have no touch, no power. Uh, people sitting in the pew, uh, when I was raised, uh, they grabbed the horns of the altar and began to call on God, uh, and lives would be changed. Sinners would get saved, revival would break out. Uh, uh, but now people pray and pray and pray and nothing happens because they don't have any power of God in their life. Because you're too interested in knowing everything about Donald Trump and you're not interested in knowing about Jesus. Paul said, I want to know Him and I want to know the power of His resurrection. When was the last time you said, God... I want to experience Holy Ghost power. You say, oh, preach, that's real charismatic. Well, call it what you want. All I know is Peter got up and preached on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Ghost fell on it. Every man heard in his own language, and 3,000 souls got saved. You can become a critic when you win 3,000 souls in a day. You say, what was the difference? Had the power of God on him. They all thought Peter was drunk. He was on the Holy Spirit I'm just wondering are you reaching forth if you've been saved any length of time you ought to desire to know more about Jesus now than you did when you first got saved and you ought to ask the Lord Lord show me things you know he's promised he says seeking you shall find 
There have been times, I, 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 Brother Tony, I've tried to wrap my mind around something in the Scriptures, and you can read commentators, and some of them are good, and some of them are just commentators. They don't know any more than me. A lot of them just repeat something somebody else said. Uh, 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 but I begin to read and begin to study and begin to uh, compare line upon line, precept upon precept, uh, and the uh, sweet Holy Spirit of God illuminate the Scriptures, uh, begin to show me something, say, that's it, that's it, that's it. How did, how did that happen? Because I asked him. I wanted to know. Jesus said the Comforter would lead us and guide us into all truth. I wonder... Are you reaching forth? You ought to reach farther to fellowship with Christ. You ought to desire to know Him with a personal intimacy, with the power of His resurrection. But also, you ought to seek to partner with Him in His sufferings. See, whether or not you understand this, when you hurt, He hurts. So what hurts Him ought to hurt you. When people blaspheme His name, that ought to hurt you. When sinners reject Him, that ought to hurt you. When the saints of God fall by the wayside and fall and, and become backslidden, that ought to hurt you. You see, if you get hurt over somebody that fails the grace of God, guess what that will do? That will give you compassion to help pick them up. That will give you a burden to forgive if they ask for forgiveness. I wonder... Are you willing to reach forth? You ought to reach farther to fellowship with Christ. We ought to reach farther to follow Christ. It amazes me how people will follow anybody or anything if they sound good. But you can tell them the truth and they think you're crazy. The Bible even said in the last days they'd be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. We ought to reach farther to follow Christ. You see, nothing else really matters other than being obedient to Him. The old hymn writer had it right, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. How can I reach farther to follow Him? Well, simple, just trust His promises. You know what is so wonderful about your Bible? There's over 30,000 promises in there, and you'll never exhaust them all, but i got news for you, you're going to need them. Matter of fact, the closer we get to him taking the church out of here and rapturing us out of here, friend, we're going to need them promises. Things aren't going to get better. They're going to get worse. Last year we, we heard them say we weren't essential. We won't be long. And they're going to say we're not needed. We need to learn to trust his promises. A little book that we probably got some in the library over there about God's promises. Just a book full of promises. Promise for everything you're going to face. Uh, boy, a good promise has got me through some jams. Got me through some heartaches. I'm glad he promised he'd never leave us nor forsake us. I'm glad he promised to be a friend that stick it closer and a brother. I'm glad he promised that uh, uh, he, he, his word would not return void. I'm glad that he promised to go prepare a place for us. I mean, we could go on and on and on. We ought to reach forth to follow Him through trusting His promises, through putting into practice the pattern that He lived. We all want to be called Christian, which means Christ-like. Do you realize that the Gospels were given not only to show that He came to bleed and die for our sin, was buried and rose again according to the Scriptures, uh, but the manner, Brother Ray, in which He conducted His life is the pattern, the yardstick, the measuring stick that we ought to strive to live up to. He showed us in his life how to handle every situation of life. It was our pattern. And yet, we'll listen to what Oprah Winfrey says more than what Jesus says. Hmm. We ought to put into practice the pattern that he lived. He said things like, not my will, but thine be done to his Father. When others were sleeping, he'd go up in the mountain and pray. When others 
uh, said stoner. He just got down and didn't say a word and wrote in the sand. When he looked up and said, where's your accusers? She said, I have no accusers, and neither do I accuse thee. Go and sin no more. Uh, he gave us a pattern how to show compassion, how to please the Father, and how to certainly be an example for others to look unto God. Can I say this? We had to reach forth, follow Christ through the path that he set before us. Hmm. He's a good shepherd, chief shepherd, great shepherd. He leads the sheep. He didn't ask us to get ahead of him. He just said, come, follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Hmm. You know, it's a good day when you don't have to make the decisions. You just let him make them. Just follow him. One writer said this, Faith never knows where it's being led, but it loves and knows the one who's doing the leading. I don't need to know where he's taking me. I just need to know him. And he is the anchor within the veil. I know where it ends up. Stonewall Jackson once said this, and Rob D. Lee said the South lost the war because Stonewall Jackson died. But when he lost his arm in battle, some reporter trying to make a name for himself said, General Jackson, if you could have your arm back, if God would miraculously restore your arm, would you want that? He said, that is not up to me, that is up to my maker. And then they went on to ask him, said, well, you... you you just stand there on the battlefield and and you don't sit up way up on the hillside where all the other generals are. You're down there with your troops. Aren't you worried for your life? And again, he said, again, that is not up to me. That is up to my maker. Whether I die in battle or die crossing the street, that is up to him. God help us to just be so resigned to the fact the Lord is the Lord. He does all things well. Where he leadeth, I will follow. Huh? The rest of it, just leave it up. It'll make your life so much easier. You can get off your ulcer medicine. You don't have to worry about anything anymore. Just reach forth to follow Him. Hmm? Now, if you take ulcer medicine, don't go home and quit your ulcer medicine, huh? Come huh? back. I quit my ulcer medicine. Now it's bleeding ulcer, and it's all the preacher's fault. Well, I have an addendum. <laughs> Dr. Phil's giving me permission to say whatever I want to say back here, huh? you got to be careful nowadays. There are some people that take everything literal. It's called discernment, friends. We need to reach forth. How do we reach forth? We need to reach forth through forgetting the things behind us. Again, verse number 13. But this one thing I do, forgetting those and I have it circled in my Bible, things, plural. There's not just one thing gets you sidetracked. And if we're honest, we spend too much time not facing heaven like a flint, but we spend too much time looking backwards. You can learn from what's back here, but if you dwell on what's back here, it's going to mess you up. Yesterday's gone. You can't change it. Every one of us in here, if you've lived any time at all, if God gave you an eraser and said you could go back and erase this out of your life, we'd all have something we'd like to do away with, something we're not proud of, something we wish that wasn't there. Uh, uh, but friend, if you dwell on that, it'll mess you up. You reach forth by forgetting the things that are back there that want to keep you back there. Hmm? So what kind of things? The pitfalls. Uh, listen, if you step in a mud puddle, get your foot out, get it cleaned up, and go on. Uh, if we'll confess our sins, He's faithful and just, forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if He's forgiven it, quit trying to remind Him of it, because He don't know what you're talking about. It's gone. 
Some of you, every day, you let the devil take you back to some pitfall, and you're dwelling there. You have no victory. You've pulled back in the prison. You're stuck in your box because you're looking back at how sorry, no good you was on that particular occasion. Listen, David blew it big time. But I challenge you to go study his life. He did more for God after his fall than he did before. Why? Because Psalm 51, he got right with God. Hmm? If the Apostle Paul would have dwelled on Stephen getting stoned, if he would have dealt on all the, the murders he caused and maybe even committed, if he'd have dealt on all the things that he did perse persecuting the church, do you think he'd ever stood up on Mars Hill and proclaimed to them the unknown God? No. Had to forget those things, those pitfalls. Hmm? I get it, you blew it. But I'm glad for the grace of God. I'm glad for the mercy of God. I'm glad for the cleansing of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He does forgive sin. He hates sin. He doesn't justify your sin. He'll deal with you with your sin if you won't deal with sin. But it's a good day when you can get that sin under the blood and go on. There is therefore now no condemnation in that walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Thank God for forgiveness. How about the, the things that people get caught up? How about dwelling on the people who've hurt us? Now, if you've not been saved long, God bless you. I'm glad you're enjoying that love, new relationship in Christ and how the joy of the Lord, and it's all wonderful. And by the way, it gets better. It just gets gooder and gooder, as they used to say. But if you're at this thing long enough, somebody's going to hurt your confidence. Somebody's going to do you wrong. I'm talking about somebody you, you, you would never think would do you wrong. Somebody that claims to be saved. Say, preacher, why? Well, they might be having a bad day. Might not be you personally. Might just be having a bad day. They might make some bad choices. They might get out of the will of God and they're so miserable they don't care who they hurt. But if you're not careful, you'll let that hurt turn into bitterness. And bitterness will destroy you. And if all you're doing is looking back at hurt, you're getting bitter. He who angers you controls you, friend. You've got to learn to forget those things, and the only way you can forget somebody who's hurt you is learn to forgive them, whether they ask for it or not because we're talking about your well-being, not their well-being. You've got to learn to forget the people who have hurt you. Sometimes they don't know they've hurt you. Sometimes it was not intentional. Listen, uh, Brother Clint, Miss Rhonda's there, their, their boys served in hot spots in uh, the Middle East. And I'm sure if he w wants to talk about it, talk about it. not everybody died, died from foreign fire. Sometimes there's friendly fire. Wasn't intentional. Just in, a, in, a, in an ambush, in a hot spot, bullets start flying, and it's bad. Sometimes in the midst of the battle, and serving Christ, sometimes there are casualties, and sometimes they're not from the devil. Sometimes somebody says something out of ignorance. Sometimes somebody says something didn't really mean it, or sometimes somebody acts ugly and didn't really mean it, but damage is done. Friend, if you're not careful, you'll carry that scar, and you'll never get to where you reach forth and let Jesus put that balm of Gilead on it and heal you. You've got to forget those things. They'll eat you up. The problems we've encountered. I know when we come to church, everybody thinks nobody else has problems. If you're breathing, you've got problems. Job says the man's day is few and full of trouble. You might not be having bad problems today, but hang around, neighbor, they're coming. Hmm? Joe Biden's still got to over three years, man. I mean, was... people have problems. That's why I always caution you, you never know the trouble or the trauma behind the smiles that people wear in the church. There are folks that, that have problems. You'll have problems. If you dwell on the problems, you'll end up in a well with your problems, having yourself a pity pot problem. 
I'm here to tell you, but if you can get them problems him, he said, casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. He'll take your problems and you, friend, to greater heights. And I thought about the, uh, you've got to forget the pain you've experienced. We are human beings. We're not supermen and women. You cut us, we're going to bleed. You're going to have pain. My heart hurts for these two families that are going to bury loved ones this week. It's always a rough week for me. Yeah, my mother's been gone about eight years now. Mother's, you know. It's, it's, it's never easy, even though you know they're with the Lord. You miss the fellowship. Pain. There's physical pain. I just noticed some Brother Sammy when he's preaching. Sunday night, his head was cocked to the left. He's got a spine like a, like a snake anyway. Broke his back playing soccer as a young boy. Drags that foot. He don't complain, but he's in pain 24-7. That's why I'm glad Doc spends some time, works on him, and puts him in all kinds of presses and jabs him with needles and beats him up. And he did not know this. If you haven't heard this, this is funny. She's a chiropractor. She cracks his back. Well, he started calling her Dr. Cracker. <laughs> he didn't realize in America a black man can't call a white person a cracker. But he does it. And so I said, you going to see the cracker? Shoot. Now, how about that? He didn't know. I'm glad she helps him. It's one reason she's trying to get her license in St. Lucia because there's a lot of folks down there need help. They don't have the medical personnel we do. I just noticed he was in pain. I know some of you are in pain. Some of the things you go through. Brother Gary's in pain back there. He had that neck surgery hoping for some relief. It brought him nothing but pain. You can dwell on your pain. You know all you're going to do is hurt. Or you can reach forth. So Lord help me. And he may not alleviate all the pain. But he'll replace some of the pain with himself and then the pain don't matter as much I wonder are you willing to forget the things that are behind dwelling on these things just hold us back we need to learn to forgive and forgo last point I'll be done I'm talking about reaching forth quit holding pack need to reach forth for the finish for Christ this thing's winding down friend I don't know how much more time we got I don't know it's all in the Lord's hand uh, no man knows the day or the hour but in accordance to the scripture everything that needs to happen is happening it will be any day if we're going to do anything for Jesus we better get her done now hmm? we ought to set our sights on finishing it amazes me when you talk to people when they talk about everything they've got planned and the only thing that you never hear anything about is what they're doing for the Lord. Hmm? This ought to be our mindset when we finish. We should set our sights on finishing with no reserves. When we get to heaven, we ought to have nothing left in our tank. Now, Josh, you was a little bit younger than me. I didn't get to see you play much ball. I know he's a lot skinnier then. But Roger Elam gave me the greatest compliment that I ever had. We went up, played Western Brown, hated him. You know how they cheat and take the light out above the goal and just, man, they'd bring in refs from over there where Rod was from. Uh, didn't even have paved roads. Them guys didn't know how to call a game. We got it handed to us 
and he'd come in. We knew we was getting it. You had dire. Yeah. Same cloth, you know what I mean, man? They had mean and nasty, and then they took it up a notch. You know what I'm saying? And he'd come in and gave me one of the greatest compliments. He said, Foster walked off the court with nothing left. I did that for a stupid basketball game. Why wouldn't I do that for the souls of men and women? I know you mean well. And you say, preacher, I'll take some time off when I had my cancer surgery or my neck surgery or my back surgery or all them other surgeries I've had. Preacher, y'all slow down. Y'all. You know why I don't? This might be the last time I ever get to. I don't want to have anything left. There's too much at stake. I look at these kids. Hmm? This little fella grows up. He looks like his daddy sitting back there. By the way, isn't it something? The boy's on the front row. Dad's near the back row. That ought to tell you something right there. Brother Doug may be long gone off the scene. I want him to be able to say, but I had a preacher. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I was going to preach the Word of God. Didn't compromise. Didn't hold back. I wonder. You ought to set your sight on finishing with no reserves. Hmm? Too many Christians got... Our nest egg spirituality. You're waiting for the last hurrah. Well, it's the last hurrah. Got to let her go. I thought about this. We ought to have no reserves. We ought to have no retreat. Somebody wrote a song. We've come too far to turn back now. Hmm. No retreat. I've done look back. There's nothing back there. Forgetting those things. We're pressing on. The prize. The high calling. Christ Jesus. No retreat. Hmm. Thought about this, no regarding. Have no distractions that's going to keep me from reaching forth. It's going to hurt my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, the devil's got a lot of distractions out there. Hmm. I wonder what's kept you being distracted from the Word of God, your prayer life. Huh? Let me talk to Doc over here. How come we can make time for everything but Jesus? How come we can go visit everybody we want to visit except Jesus? How come we can talk to everybody we want to talk to but Jesus? How come we can get on that stupid phone and find out everybody's business but Jesus' business? Hmm? Hmm. Hmm. Too many distractions. Hear me and hear me well. I don't care what it is or who it is. If it takes you away from the Lord's will, you don't need it. We should set our sights on finishing with no remiss. Leaving nothing left undone. No stone unturned. Do all we can for the honor and glory of God. And then I thought about this with no regrets. I wonder... If in the next hour we were standing at the judgment seat of Christ, if you'd have regrets, you might as well shake your head. You would. Uh, listen, pin this down. Don't wish to do better. Do better. Don't wish to be better. Be better. Make up your mind you're going to finish well. Just do better. Be better. You can, because He's living in you. And it starts with reaching forth. Hmm. I gave you this quote the other night. Failing is not a disgrace unless you make it the last chapter of your book. Say, Brother Doug, it's not been real good up to now. Well, you got now. Make up your mind, you're going to reach forth. Make up your mind, you're going to do better. If the Apostle Paul sitting in a prison cell says, I'm reaching forth, you and I with the liberty of Christ can reach forth. I wonder. 
Will you reach for Will you make up your mind? You may not be much, but everything you are, you're going to put it all in and serve Jesus Christ. The world has yet to see one church totally sold out for the honor and glory of God. Jesus turned the world upside down with 12 men, and one of them was of the devil. What could he do with a crowd this size who goes all in and reaches forth to do what they can while they can for the honor and glory of God? Tell you what he could do. He could change lives. And he could change somebody's life here tonight. Maybe you've been playing at it. Why don't you tonight make up your mind, I'm going all in. I'm just going to give the Lord everything. I'm going to become Romans 12, 1 and 2. Just going all in. Become a living sacrifice for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Tell you what, I want to pastor that church. I want to be a pastor that is worthy to pastor that church. It's up to you and I. Will we reach forth? Or will we get back in our box, become complacent, blame everything and every, on everybody else but ourselves and not take any responsibility? Paul said, I'm reaching forth. I wonder tonight, will you reach forth? Brother Clint, just pick something on your guitar. Folks already praying, come to the altar. Let's all stand tonight. Maybe tonight you just need to come. Say, Lord, I want to do what I can while I can. Lord, help me. I want to know you better. Folks are coming. These young kids are coming. What a blessing. Right, he's getting his guitar. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, I, I want to be so much more than I have been. Please forgive me where I have failed you and come short of your glory. Help me to reach for, set my sights and affections on things above. Help me to live in honor of your name and help me to please you. Help me to follow you. And help me, Lord, to help somebody else along the way. God, these folks in this altar, you know the need. Thank you for the response. Help them, God. Oh, give them grace and strength. Undergird them with truth and the compassion of God. Give them the power of God on their life to shine as lights in this dark world. To be a royal priesthood and a peculiar people that will see a great harvest of souls come to Christ before it's too late. Send revival in these days. God, there may be somebody here tonight that's never reached forth for salvation. They've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray they'd come. Let's take a Bible and show them how to be saved. Lord, there may be some here saved, but Lord, living far beneath their privileges as a Christian, God, help them reach forth. God, someone may be really struggling with something in their past. God, give them victory over it. God, whatever the need, I pray you'd get glory and honor right now. Blessing this invitation. We'll bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.